Good evening. It's my privilege to welcome you to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I hope you think of the library and all its many branches throughout Philadelphia, as I do, as the palaces for the people. It's where everyone is welcome and everything is free. <laughs> think of the literacy events that take place in our libraries. Think of English being taught as a second language. Think of seven million items that are available in our libraries. Think of 25,000 programs that are conducted in our libraries over the course of a year. For those reasons, I invite you to join me in the VAST program. V for visit, A for advocate, Advocate to your friends, but particularly advocate for those people who are on city council, who control the budget that the library has to deal with. And the fact that the spending per person in Philadelphia on the library is one of the lowest in the United States. And then S for support. Each of us needs to write a check to help the enrichment programs that are such a vital part, like the after-school programs for the children and young adults that take place in our libraries. So, turn off your cell phones, no flash photography. Melinda Gates really needs no introduction. So I'm not going to attempt to add to your knowledge that's there. But what I am going to tell you is that she's really written two books. One book is about her life's journey from the macho culture at Microsoft that she encountered as one of the first women to work there to her journey with Bill in terms of forming their partnership. It's a wonderful vignette. She even tells you a little bit about their first date. But she's also written a second book and the second book is about gender equity. And one of my concerns is that this book is going to be largely read by women. And I think that's unfortunate. So for each of you women, I ask you to take your copy and make sure a man reads it. <laughs> because, <laughs> because in order for true gender equity to take place, in order for a true partnership to take place, I agree with Melinda. If you want to lift up humanity, empower women. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to see a video before Melinda, and she's going to be in conversation with John Green, who is a noted author and he, by the way, is from Indianapolis, Indiana. And of course, we know a couple of politicians that are from Indiana. But in any event, they'll be in conversation. So save your applause. But when they come out, let's give them a wonderful Philadelphia welcome after the video. When I was little, space launches were a huge deal in my life. I can still feel in my bones the suspense of those countdowns especially that moment of lift when the engines ignite and the earth shakes and the rocket starts to rise. As I've traveled the world for 20 years doing the work of the foundation I co-founded with my husband, Bill, I've wondered, how can we summon a moment of lift for human beings and especially for women? Because sometimes all that's needed to lift women up is to stop pulling them down. In my travels, I've learned about hundreds of millions of women who want to decide for themselves whether and when to have children, but they can't. And there are many other rights and privileges that women and girls are denied. The right to go to school, start a business, run for office, study computers, find investors. Sometimes these rights are denied under law, but even when they're allowed by law, they're still often denied by cultural bias against women. If we are going to take our place as equals with men, it won't come from winning our rights one by one or step by step. Women and men should all work together to take down the barriers and end the biases 
that still hold women back. More than at any time in the past, we have the knowledge and energy and moral insight to crack the patterns of history. Our call is to lift women up. Because when you lift up women, you lift up humanity. Please welcome John Green and Melinda Gates. This chair really encourages good posture. Hello. I'm so thrilled to be here uh, with, with Melinda Gates, who is the author of this truly extraordinary book. I'm sure that most of you have not read it. It is astonishing. It, it is, it, it, for many people, I think, will be life-changing. I know uh, that, that for my, my wife and me, it's, it's a book that we've been discussing ever since we read it, and that, that has really shifted our, our thinking and our understanding of the universe in big ways. I'm so excited for you to read it, and I, and I echo Morris 100% that uh, after you read it, you should give it to a man you love. <laughs> or three or four. <laughs> yeah. Actually, no, forget that. Buy a second copy. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't have my bookseller hat on there. Uh, but I'm so thrilled to, to be able to talk with you about this book. And we also have some questions from the audience. Thank you for, uh, for your questions as well. I want to begin by uh, asking you about listening, because what struck me in this book is that so much of what you learn in your work has come from listening and, and how much you begin your philanthropy from a place of listening. How do we get better at listening and especially at listening to the stories that we're not hearing? Yeah, thanks for that question, John. Um, so I think listening is one of these fundamental traits and you have to listen carefully to what people say and even the meaning behind the words or the tone of what they say. And I think it's a trait I was incredibly lucky to learn as a young woman from my own mo mother. Mm. Um, I, have, I grew up in Dallas, Texas. I have uh, two parents. Uh, they now both live in California together. Um, but when I would come home as a girl from school and I was struggling with anything, a math problem, a speech I had to give, a friendship, whatever, my mom would sit down because I grew up in Dallas, it, with a glass of iced tea. She'd stir us both a glass of iced tea, and she would sit there with me after school for about 45 minutes, even though I had three other siblings, and listen. And she was always there to support me. And um, it's a trait that I think I have tried to carry into our work. And I asked a few people, when we started the foundation, um, I asked President Carter, came out to visit, and um, I asked him, President Carter, because he'd already been working in global health at that point for quite a while, and I said, what should Bill and I know now as we start our foundation that you learned over time that maybe we um, wouldn't have to relearn? And he said, you know, Melinda, whatever you all do as a foundation, you have to go in and make absolutely certain that the people in the context you're going into, whatever country it might be in Africa, that they want what you're bringing and that they're asking mm -hmm. you for it or at least beginning that, that discussion. And he said, because you can go in and do work and they might follow your path while you're there, but the second you leave, it'll go back to their original way. And he said, so you have to listen carefully and make sure you get buy-in from the community. And it's just advice we've tried to heed ever since then. Yeah, that brings up another one of my questions. You write about how um, your, your friend Hans, when he first learned of your work, said, oh great, another billionaire uh, who's going to ruin things. Um, and you write a lot about how people with good intentions uh, and lots of money can both miss opportunities to affect change uh, and in some cases, make things more difficult because they fail to understand cultural dynamics in play, because they go in with a solutions mindset instead of with a listening mindset. Um, and also, I think, maybe because of empathy barriers, which is something you, you wrote about very beautifully in this book. You, you talk about how sometimes it's not just a language barrier, there's also an empathy barrier. I wonder how we can break down those empathy barriers that so often get in the way of doing good, and, and also if you have any thoughts on how to avoid you know, being the 800-pound gorilla that can do as much damage as good. 
Yeah, so Hans Rosling, who you're referencing, who I mentioned in the book, who since has passed away, he was a professor of global health at Karolinska University. Uh, he's Swedish. And, uh, and I'll leave that story for the book that he says about a billionaires missing up things. I learned so much from Hans. You and I were also talking about Paul Farmer backstage, who runs Partners in Health. Meeting both of them early in the work, I saw they were both doctors. Um, so Hans was both a global health infectious disease specialist, but he was a, first and foremost a medical doctor who had lived and worked in Mozambique. And Paul Farmer I first met at his clinic in Haiti. And what I saw in those two men and the organizations they ran was that then when they treated a patient, they didn't just treat the patient for their illness, they thought of the person as a whole human being. And Paul would go right up and he knew the name of the patient's sister and how's your mother doing? She was here last week, how's she doing? And same thing with Hans. And I think so often we go in and we think we know better than someone else. You know, I think often because we're a high income country, you can go in thinking, okay, if you go into a low income setting that maybe we know better how to do things. No, we've been lucky. I mean, in a certain sense, that a country like the United States, to be born in the United States compared to being born in Mozambique or Sierra Leone, where you just were, or Senegal, we are lucky. And the, our country got going from low income to middle income because of certain infrastructure investments. But we, when we go to those countries, we need to sit down with people we are equals, we are absolutely equals, and I believe that. The, the foundation's premise that Bill and I started the foundation with is that all lives, all, have equal opportunity, but not all have equal value, but not everybody has equal opportunity. And only, I think, if you sit down and in real conversations try to understand people's lives can you empathize and understand and say to yourself, I always try to say to myself when I sit in a community with other moms, what if you know, were often sitting on a small mat, maybe about this size or half the size of this, and I'll think of what if the mat was turned and I was the other mom on the other side of the mat and this Western woman was coming in and asking me about my family's life, what would I want her to know about the lengths and the means I would go to to save my children's life and what she or someone from the West might do to help? And I think only in put, trying to put ourselves in the shoes of others and having real conversation can we understand somebody else's life. Yeah. I want to ask you about contraception mm -hmm. and family planning and Catholicism. Uh, I, I wonder how difficult it was as a Catholic to become such a public advocate for family planning and, and also if you can share with us why you've come to understand that access to contraception is so important. Yeah. Um, I often say that I was a reluctant advocate uh, uh, in this particular space because I am Catholic. I went to an all-girls Catholic high school, grew up, went to K-8 through Catholic school, uh, went to church six days a week when I was little. Um, and the Catholic Church does not believe in contraceptives. And yet, when I would be out in so many countries in Africa, different places, I would be there to talk about vaccines, and women would talk to me all day about how they save lives of their kids, they've walked 10 kilometers in the heat to get them, they know when they're available, um, but they would often say to me, but what about my health? What about that contraceptive? How come at this exact same clinic we're sitting outside of talking about vaccines, how come I used to be able to get birth control and now mm -hmm. I can't? Why not? And I was quite frankly shocked at how many women were knew about, about contraceptives, were telling me literally, this is a life and death situation. I just had a baby, I can't have another one. I can't feed another one and it's dangerous for me, for my health to have another child within a year. And yet I came back to learn that the, because of po the politics in the United States and things that had happened and religious beliefs, even though women at an over 90% rate in the United States use these tools, we as a global health community had stopped uh, delivering them in the developing world. And so I really had about 18 months or two years where I had to wrestle with my faith and think, am I really gonna speak out against this church that, whose values I learned and in, ingrained deeply, the values of social justice and service. And yet at the end of the day, I know that I believe in saving moms and babies' lives. And so I decided to eventually take a stand on that and um, 
help gather our partners together in governments and raise a very substantial fund to try and give women access, the two, over 200 million women that are asking us for access to contraceptives, to try and make those much more broadly available in the developing world. I'm also interested in the choice about whether to advocate for reform by continuing to be inside of, of a group like a faith community or a political party or a school system or whatever versus the choice of leaving that group and trying to work from change outside of it. Because trying to work from change inside of a group can be very uncomfortable because a lot of times the people in power in that group will be like, please stop talking. <laughs> And I'm just curious how you've, how you've made that choice. Um, I think you make those choices thoughtfully and over time. Uh, I can only say that's how Bill and I make those decisions um, inside the foundation. Uh, you know, we try to take the long view. And so we're always trying to say to ourselves, okay, in any country, we are working with so many country governments over time. Um, can, we're always saying to ourselves, can and how how and can we work with this current government that's in place in a given country? So we are always trying to work within the government to the extent we can. But there does come a point at which if you have this deep-seated belief and you have good data and you are out doing this work, which we have been now for over 20 years, and you just fundamentally disagree with a group, I think at some point, at least I can only answer for myself, you do have to step outside of it and say, this is what I know to be true. And I have to go with what I believe and what, what my morality or beliefs say. And then you try and build a coalition of the willing who want to be on that same path and that same train. And I think sometimes that's actually how you create change in the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We have a question from the audience. It's from Bryn from Philadelphia. Hi, Bryn. How do we teach our young four to 10 year old daughters the difference between being a leader and being bossy? I just say be a leader. And if somebody calls you bossy, too bad for them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My 16-year-old daughter, who you've met when she was 14, I think, Phoebe, yeah. um, when she saw, and, I, and Cheryl Sandberg and I are friends, so I think Cheryl's fabulous, and I think the fact she's bringing these issues forward and we're discussing them is great. Let me just say that. But I happened to have the Wall Street Journal open on a Saturday morning on the kitchen counter, and it said, you know, ban bossy by, you know, Cheryl Sandberg. And my four, then 14-year-old Phoebe walked in, and as you know, she's quite opinionated, and she said, she goes, why would we ban that word? Whoever's saying it should just stop saying it. And I was like, yeah, that's pretty much true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, every time somebody says, like, like, you're bossy, you should just respond, I think you mean that I'm a leader. <laughs> well said. That's great. Um, I, I want to talk about... So, so there's a lot in this book that's about your experiences uh, traveling the... Uh, the all the many things that, that you've learned in your philanthropic work, you also write very movingly and, and in a really deeply personal way about your own marriage and about finding equality in that marriage. Um, you have a somewhat unusual marriage, but aren't all marriages a little weird? And Thank you for that. <laughs> yes. They are, yeah. Uh, but find, I think finding equality in unpaid work, in unpaid labor, in, in what is sometimes called emotional labor, uh, is super important and something that men uh, tend to get a little defensive about when the subject comes up because there isn't equality in, in most households when it comes to unpaid labor. Um, but you write, it, and I found this very, it gave me a lot of hope and it also spurred a lot of conversations in our family, as did your annual letter when you wrote about this a couple years ago. Uh, you write about the real change that you've seen both in your marriage and in, and in, other, uh, and in other communities and not just in the US but around the world. And I wonder if you can share some of that experience and also talk a bit about what we can do to accelerate a movement toward real gender equality within our families. Yeah, thanks. Um, so equality, the whole reason I did this book is because I just don't think equality 
can wait. And when we have this moment in time, right, between the Me Too movement, so many women, which is fabulous, running for office in 2018 in the midterm elections, but we have to look and say, are we there yet as a nation and in terms of true equality? And the answer is no, unfortunately. And so I try to talk about in the book the various barriers that I think hold women back all over the world. And one of the barriers that holds women back is this unpaid labor. There's no country in the world where men and women do the same amount of work at home. Um, and so in the United States, it's 90 minute gap. A woman does 90 minutes more of unpaid labor in her home than her husband does. Now, you have to say some of that labor are things that we do want to do, right? You care for a loved one, be there at bedtime, all of those loving things. But there's also just a lot of work to go around, right? There's the garbage has to be put out and the dishes and the laundry and all of those kinds of tasks. And yet, I think so often we come, I talk about myself in the book to talk about how even I came into my marriage biased, thinking, okay, there's certain things that a woman does at home and there's certain things that a man does at home. And the reason I write this chapter is to talk about if we don't look at that, if we don't stand up and recognize the amount of work that has to be done in our homes, and we don't then say, well, how do we redistribute that workload? Is there anything we can do to reduce it? But also, how do we redistribute it evenly? Because today, we are asking the United States a dual task of women. You know, 47% of our workforce in the United States today is women. And yet, if they're doing 90 minutes more work at home, you're taking away from other productive things they may want to do, or a little bit of free time, or a little bit of health, right? And so the, I do write a personal part of this chapter just to talk about our own marriage. Um, which is, you know, Bill's the CEO of Microsoft. Very hard charging job, very hard charging industry. Um, I was also working at Microsoft. I love my career there. I worked for nine years. But when I got pregnant with our first daughter, um, Jen, I said to Bill, I surprised Bill and said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave work. And he was shocked because he knew how much I loved it. And I said, no, 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 you know, if you're gonna run Microsoft, which you're clearly gonna still do for quite some time, and we wanna have the family that we both imagine, somebody I felt needed to be home with the kids. And I didn't mind staying home. But as we got further into that, even a year in, Bill could see that I loved to work and that I had that part of my brain. And so he really encouraged me to start getting more involved in philanthropy, um, taking on some more things. But we got to the point where our gen was starting to ready to go to kindergarten. We both agreed the right school we wanted her into wasn't close to our house, 45 minutes away. And I just said, oh my gosh, Bill, why don't we just keep her in the little neighborhood school she's in and in third grade we'll send her to that school because I can see all these years of traffic ahead in the minivan, you know, driving to school and I can see my life going by. And so Bill said, no, I feel strongly about her beginning in, at kindergarten. And finally he turned the question around. He said, he said what can I do to help? And I kind of looked at him like, are you serious? And he said, well, and he offered, he said, well, I could drive two mornings a week. And for him, driving was an hour because he went to the school, dropped her off, went, walked in the classroom, did the whole drop off thing, came past our house back to Microsoft. And so, um, and he also reframed the conversation for me. He said, you know, Melinda, I said, you're willing to do that? And he said, yeah, he said, because it'll be a great time for me in the car with Jen, and he was right. It reframed for me that time in the car, and we've so valued it with our three kids that even our youngest now is 16. One day a week, I go with our 16-year-old, she drives the car, her car, to school, and I go with her in the car, and about one day a week, Bill goes with her. Uh, we listen to a lot more Cardi B than I would like to listen to. But, <laughs> but the other thing in kindergarten... I that mean, that is so much better than the music that nine-year-olds are listening to. <laughs> I would kill for some Cardi B in the car right now. I did that phase. Uh, Disney everything, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but one other thing I'll say is when at kindergarten, when we started doing this, uh, you know, as a family, this was right for us, about three weeks into the school year, one of the moms kind of sidled up to me and said, hey, see anything different in the classroom? And I said, gosh, there are, are a lot of dads dropping off. <laughs> and she said, yeah, we went home and we moms said to our husband, if Bill Gates can drive, by God, you can too. <laughs> But it is that, it is that, that 
those difficult conversations. I'd love to say they were all elegant in my household. That one actually went quite well. Some of them are not quite so lovely right. um, on my part. But it is that recognizing what we do as women and as caregivers and saying, I need help, or for the man to step in and say, let's help. And it does role model what's right in society. Now, I've ha recently had, it's been interesting, some 20 and 30 year olds say, well, hey, look, we believe in gender equality, so does our, my spouse, and we're, we're doing that in our household. And I say, okay, great. So when you have your first child, um, do you get paid family medical leave? Only 14% of this nation gets paid family medical leave, 14%. And yet every industrialized nation, every other one in the world, has paid family medical leave. And so when you think about that and what we're saying to moms and dads about caring for their children, that's a policy to me that we absolutely need to stand up. Men and women need to stand up and say, let's change that in this mm -hmm. country. Because I believe most men have aging parents they will need to take care of. And I believe most women do too. And when a child is first born, if the dad stays home for some of that time, there's great research that shows he bonds more with the kid and also participates more in the child re rearing over the course of the life. And that's just good for the dad and the child. Absolutely. I, I want to ask you something about that because you referred to that research, you referred to the research that we have that uh, in the U.S. women do 90 minutes more of, of unpaid labor per week, I believe. That, that, and Per day. Oh, God. <laughs> Are you sure you want to keep on this path? <laughs> <sighs> anyway, you really got to buy this book for the men in your life. Uh, Father's Day gift. Oh, what a great Father's Day. It really is a great Father's Day gift, though. Because it's, for about, yourself. It's, about becoming a better it's about becoming a better dad. It really is. It's about becoming a more engaged dad, having a better life with your family and with your kids. It's... It's not, it's not an attack. That's the beautiful thing about it. It's not like, oh, you know, it, and that, that's what I love about your approach to it. But what I wanted to ask you about before I put my foot in my mouth there was that <laughs> we know that because we have the data. Yeah. And one of the things that you write about in this, in this book is that there are so many places where we don't have data and where we haven't collected data, where we haven't paid attention to the, the work that women do and treated it like work. And as a result, our... our our understanding of the world through data has been really, really biased. And, and essentially, data can be sexist because data is collected by humans, and humans bring their own biases into it. I wonder if you can talk about that in some of the ways that, that you, you, you're working to correct for that. Yeah, I've been so surprised by this because I always thought data was objective. So you right. have great data, you make decisions based on it, you move forward. But the truth is our data is biased. And I'll give you an example in the developing world just as one. I could give you like 10. Uh, the best household surveys, and they are really good, have been done for almost 30 years by USAID out in, the, in many countries in Africa. But just to give you an example, when they would go into the home and ask the first question of who has income in the family, the father often speaks first because he's the head of the household and he often does have the most income. But we weren't going deeper and then asking the second question, which is, so once he answered, that was, then they would go down a whole set of questions about his income. But they never stopped and said, does anyone else in the household have income? Well, it turns out women all over the world actually have assets, and they hold them and keep them in different ways to protect their assets. And if we don't ask that secondary question, we won't learn about women's crops in the developing world and what they're farming and taking to market. We won't learn how they save money for their kids' health care. We won't learn about when do they have to negotiate with the husband over money for kids' health care versus they have a little bit of their own so they can do what they want. And this becomes fundamentally important because two of the biggest levers, there, there are no silver bullets all over the world in terms of how you get true gender equality for society. But two things we have learned in our foundation work, because we look for levers that we can pull to change. One is contraceptives, which you and I already spoke about, the greatest anti-poverty tool in the world. No nation has made it from low to middle income country without allowing access to contraceptives for women. It lifts them out of poverty. 
But the other lever has to do with women's income, which is we are learning that the cell phone is actually an amazing tool for women to have a digital bank account. So you go to Philippines, Tanzania, Bangladesh, Kenya, there is mobile money. And a woman will tell you when she can save in her village or in her township a dollar a day, two dollars a day, and she has her secure bank account on her phone with her fingerprint, when her husband dies, the brother-in-law can no longer get hold of it. When there's a health emergency in the family and the husband's off in another town, she doesn't have money, he's off working, she's got assets. She doesn't have to renegotiate with the husband. He already gave her money for the kid's health, but guess what? We have two bouts of malaria this season, not one. I don't have to renegotiate with my husband. And she will tell you when she has assets, the way the family treats her is different. So she'll say, you know, if she's in India, the way her mother-in-law looks at her is different. The mother-in-law will let her live in the home because all of a sudden she has money for soap and she can wash her sari and she's more presentable. All of a sudden she can buy a bicycle for her oldest son. One woman in India said to me, you want to be respected by your family? Buy a bicycle for your son. And so money is power, and it mm -hmm. changes the power dynamics in a family. And um, so that digital bank account and whether women have income and how they hold it and think about it and store it is fundamental to what we then need to go think about and do on this digital platform to make sure women have digital literacy and take up those bank accounts. It will change a lot for them, and it does. That's awesome. One of the things that's really difficult in global health work and in development work in general is how do we confront oppressive social norms and how do we fight uh, the stigmatization that comes with them uh, because, you know, people in the West have a long history of uh, imperialism and, and of impoverishing uh, a lot of the communities in which we're, try we're trying to... to to, to be of, of help, um, and some people are very suspicious of attempts to change social norms, and sometimes for, for very good reasons. I thought in this book you wrote really powerfully about how good social norms survive on their own and how oppressive social norms only survive uh, because, because they use the tools of oppression. I, I wonder you, if you can talk about how you've become, grown to be an advocate for changing those harmful norms, whether it's genital cutting or, or, or other things as well, or, or just you know, broad-based inequality in, in gender, um, and also what you think the future looks like. So I think, or I know, that the only way to change social norms is when a community comes forward and decides that they want to commit to making that change and they do it as a whole community or a whole village, mm -hmm. and they do it with transparency and they commit to it in the light of day, and then they continue to follow up. And I give several examples in the book. Um, you cannot come in from outside. Like, let's say you want to get a community to change its use of contraceptives. Let's say that was your goal. If you don't come in first and educate women about their bodies and educate about reproduction and educate men about why their children will be healthier if their wife can time and space the births, there's just no reason for them to listen to you. And if you want to come in and do that type of education, it has to be done in very culturally sensitive ways by people who are from that village and other people who are bringing the knowledge from outside but have lived in that country for years and understand why um, tribes or groups do things the way they do. They have good reason often for doing things the way they do. They have seen a lot of children die in, in, at young ages. They have seen a lot of women die in childbirth. So you have to approach it in very sensitive ways and then when they're ready, they have to commit as a group. But I have seen it time and time again where villages will decide, like when you come in and start educating about an issue and they'll start to maybe say, well, you know, we, we're not sure we wanna talk about that, but we, um, you know, we're hearing a lot of yelling in our village or we're hearing a lot of mm -hmm. men beating up their wives. We'd rather work on that first. You have to let them decide that's what they wanna do. 
and I had one village I was in where they had already made that commitment. They'd come out as a village and said, we're no longer gonna stand for abuse in our village. And what it meant was after they committed to that, then other men would go knock on the doors of somebody's hut if they heard a man mm. beating up his wife. But until you deal with some of that abuse, you can't even begin to get in and, and have somebody come in, an educator, and talk to the women about their health. I mean, if, if a woman's being abused, she can't stand up for her kids or for her right to go get health. So anyway, we have to do it in very culturally sensitive ways uh, with the people who are on the ground and know those places deeply. It goes back to listening. Ultimately. It totally goes back to listening. One of the things that you wrote in this book that I, I, I just, like, I feel like I should have printed on top of my computer is that overcoming the need to create outsiders is our greatest challenge as human beings. We do have this intense desire to create a them for every us, right? Like every, the Philadelphia Eagles are only possible because of the... Pittsburgh somethings. <laughs> I, only did, I, only, I only did like half of my NFL research. Um, how do we find a way to create us's that don't require a them? How do we find a way? How do we overcome that need to create outsiders? And, and how do we bring those people who are really at the margins in? I think it's by um, being in community with one another. I mean, the more I have done this work, the more I've learned from people who do this kind of work in Seattle, is unless we create true community with people who don't look like us, don't have the same background, maybe don't have their kids in the same schools our kids, have our, our kids are in, unless we tr create true community, we can't really understand each other. And I think it's often out of fear that we say, okay, this is my tribe. These are the people I know. We all have the same you know, general point of view or care about our kids in the same way. The truth is I have never met a mother and father anywhere in the world that does not care about their kids. I mean, if you say to a mom and dad, what are your hopes and dreams for your family? They always talk about in low-income countries educating their kids so their kids can have a better life. Always, I mean, it, it, like, it's not even a you know, nine out of 10 I get that answer. I ask the question, you get it 10 out of 10. And I think you know, if you asked every person in this room, do you care about your kids or your grandkids or your sister or your brother, the answer is absolutely. And so it's just sometimes we don't, if we're not in community with people um, who don't look like us, we don't realize that they care about their fellow human beings or have the same hopes and desires and dreams that we do. And so out of our fear, we kind of say, well, they're the outsiders and this is my group. And um, that's just not the truth. We're all one, one big human family. We're way more alike than we are different. There's a great chapter in this book called Letting, Letting Your Heart Break, and I wept through the whole chapter. It's very sad. Um, but I really liked the way you wrote about how it is important to make yourself proximal in some way to people who are suffering and to people who are at the margins and to let your heart break because it is only in response to that that, that we can begin to understand that, that this, this them that we've imagined is in fact us. I just thought that was such a beautiful chapter because of the way that uh, it is important to let our hearts break. It is, and it's hard, and I think sometimes we want to kind of push the pain away and mm -hmm. say, well, that wouldn't happen to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I have good health care, I have this, or I have that. And the truth is you have to say to yourself, what if I was born in this circumstance? Mm -hmm. What if I was born in Bangladesh in this exact slum? What would I do? What length would I go to? You know, Bill and Warren are incredibly articulate about the fact they could have absolutely never started Microsoft or Berkshire Hathaway in Mozambique or in Niger, I mean, pick your favorite country. I mean, there's just no way. So we are lucky to live in this country. And yet I think sometimes we think people on another continent, well, they've got all those problems, that's them. They must have done something wrong. No, we are lucky to be born in this country. We just are. Yeah. I want to ask you a, a sliding doors question that isn't about starting Microsoft in Mozambique from an audience member <laughs> who asked, how did you imagine your life trajectory would have been different if you hadn't met Bill Gates? <laughs> uh, that's hard to imagine. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I always wanted to have a family, and I always wanted to work. And I felt the luckiest thing, honestly, was that I had a teacher 
um, in high school, my math teacher, who saw computers early and brought them into the school for girls, and, and I started coding. And so honestly, the luckiest fork in my road um, was that I got hooked on computers early and knew what I wanted to study in college, and then that led to a job at Microsoft. I never could have predicted that path. And of course, if I hadn't ended up at Microsoft, I wouldn't have married Bill. Um, so I'm just, you know, I was lucky that I had a teacher who believed in me, or a set of teachers and parents who believed in me. A girl could do science and math, and then that just kind of led one thing to another. Um, yeah, but if I hadn't met Bill, I wouldn't have the three kids that I have now. Right. So. That's always the weirdest part. You think, like, I would have different children, maybe? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes my, wife is, my wife is here, and sometimes people will ask her, like, or say something, you know, to her, like, oh, you're so lucky to be married to John, and she'll be like, I mean, A, you don't know him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and B, like, he is extraordinarily lucky to be married to me, which is true. <laughs> Well, just one quick little aside to that. So, so one of the things Bill and I did early on that we didn't have to agree to, we just did, was um, we went to all parent-teacher conferences together. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, for the poor teacher, not always easy to pull up the little kid's chair across from Bill Gates and Melinda, you know? And, um, but so often we'd be, and, and it's funny, because I just ran into a mom the other day who said, oh, my husband and I, we, we do this equal work. She's in her 20s. We pretty much do this equal work in our family. And I said, really? Oh, that's good. And she goes, yeah, but I haven't figured out how to ask him to come to parent-teacher conferences. Oh. And I'm like, oh, okay. Oh. But anyway, we'd, but to your point about your partner, so we'd often go to parent-teacher conferences and the kids were little and then, you know, middle school. And we'd inevitably be walking back after the parent-teacher conference to our car and saying, huh, so um, you didn't tell me you had the history of that in your family. Or did you have that quirk <laughs> when you were a kid? Yeah, and we'd yeah, point to each right, other. Yeah. <laughs> totally, yeah, we still do that. Uh, we're still going to those parent-teacher conferences. They are fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, it is really easy to get overwhelmed and to feel despair in the face of the big challenges that humans face, like both on an individual level and on a macro level. I think one of the things that sometimes stops us from engaging deeply with the problems of people who live in absolute poverty is a feeling of overwhelmedness or a feeling of not knowing uh, where to start. Um, or even feeling at times despondent. And one of the things that really I just loved about this book is that it is honest, it is hard, and it is also optimistic. And I wanna know how you hold on to hope even when you see some of the hardest things that humans can go through. I think because at the same time where I see something, and I've seen real tragedy in some of these um, health clinics I've been in, but I think at the same time, I've just seen so much human ingenuity. Like when you're out in these low-income countries and you see the joy with which people are living life in meager circumstances, or you see the great lengths they're going to to try and add one more room onto the house or to take care of the grandmother who's ill and has had to move into their home, and they're doing it with such care and love, you know, you just realize that you know, you can find joy in almost any situation that you're in, and I see other people finding joy where I'm not even sure I could at times. But you see that and you realize, you know, we as human beings, we do work to lift ourselves and our families and others up. And when I see that, it constantly gives me hope. Um, I don't know, maybe because when I was in high school and I went to this all-girls Catholic school, the nuns sent us out in the community to work. You know, I, li I worked in the Dallas County Courthouse, I worked in the hospital, I looked, worked in the public school down the road, and they taught us, the motto of the school was Servion, that is to serve, and they taught us that one person can make the difference in the life of one other person. And that you're here on this planet and you're lucky to be healthy, and so you've got your health and you've got your brains and you've got your energy, go out and do something on behalf of someone else. And so I think any day that I feel real despair, I think, okay, well, what could I do today? And you can always do something with your time, your energy, or your money. I mean, today, you know, you can go on the internet. I couldn't do this 15 years ago. Buy a malaria bed net, it costs $10. And a malaria bed net saves two kids' lives and saves a mom's life. Why? 
is childhood death been cut in half in the last 20 years because we are actually delivering the right vaccines now in a short amount of time in the developing world, and we as a world are delivering malaria bed nets? Yeah. No, it, it, is the, it is the greatest story in human history and also the least reported that childhood death has dropped by more than half in the, in, since 1990, that maternal death has dropped by almost half since 1990. Uh, it, is, it is an astonishing, unprecedented achievement in the history of our species, and it should be like front page news every day. You know, like every day, on the, on the, I think on the front page of the newspaper, it should say um, the few, like this year, 5.42 million, or maybe uh, last year, I think, 5.42 million children under the age of five died, which is unconscionable. Almost all of those deaths uh, are easily preventable. That number should be far, far lower than it is. But in 1990, 12 million children died. And the last time fewer than 5.42 million children died on Earth wasn't 50 years ago when the population of Earth was 2.5 billion people, or 150 years ago, or 200 years ago when the population of was less than a billion. The last time that few, ch that like fewer children died on Earth was like 1,200 years ago, when the population on Earth was about 200 million. So it, it is astonishing, it's I think, astonishing. what's what's been achieved. I want to ask you what each of us can do on a practical level to help accelerate equality. Like, how do we take this book and turn it into action in our lives? Well, I would say, you know, look in every place, look in every corner. Is it, you know, look in your home, look in your community, look in your workplace and say, do I actually have equality? You know, and is that what I want, we want for our society? And if we don't have it in our homes, what are the things you need to name and redistribute amongst the family? In your community, what is it that you can get out and do? Can you mentor a young girl? Or can you open your network? If you are... I'll just say, if you're a white person in this room, you have a networks that you can help plug kids into to get them jobs. Open your network up to somebody that doesn't look like a kid you know. Open it up to a Latina girl. Open it up to a, a, you know, a black boy. And if we, want, if we want true equality, we have to look at all those places that, that there are barriers for people. So you could do that in your community. And then in your workplace, you can demand transparency. You can say, do we actually have the same number of female managers, men and women? Do we have pay transparency? Is there a gap there? Do we have a good paid family medical leave policy? You can vote for a candidate that believes in paid family medical leave at the state level or at the federal level. Um, so there's lots and lots and lots of ways to put our voice into the conversation or our energy or our time. And I would just encourage everybody to do that. Well, Melinda, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a really inspiring uh, talk for me. And um, I, I hope that you will all let this book into your hearts. It really is uh, extraordinary. So we're going to leave you today uh, with a short video to take a look at what people are already doing uh, to bring about this moment of lift. But I'm just so grateful to you for being here tonight and, for, and to all of you as well. Thanks for being a wonderful audience. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. The progress has been so slow that I'm terrified that there won't be gender equality in his lifetime. These things that we just sort of took for granted as good enough just aren't. Why do we have to work any harder to achieve that same level that other men do? We are on a tipping point now and everyone's a part of it. One of the things that I do to lift this movement is inspire young girls to get jobs in STEM where women are needed. I will be building his library with female-led character books. I will value the guidance of the women in my life, and men, you should too. I'm going to commit to the lift by being an example for our son and let him see that there's no defined role between a man and a woman. If my friend gets bullied, I'll stand up for them. I'm going to encourage young women to code. I'm going to admit, I'm a feminist. Are you a feminist? I'm going to stop saying sorry so much. I'm going to check in with myself to make sure that I'm at my strongest. It's not about whether they have more power or we have more power. It's about growing together. If you don't like respect those things, then you lose, you're missing out. We all have choices. Choose to be great. Yes! Equality can't wait. 
Equality can't wait because we can't go forward without it. Gender equality can't wait because it's past time. The only moment we have is now, and so it has to happen now.